Hello, my name is Chris. I am the operator on tonight's uh, telephone town hall discussing the facts behind Measure 2, which will be on your ballot this November. We want to hear from you tonight. This is an interactive event, so if at any time you have a question that you want to ask us, all you have to do is push zero on your phone to ask that question. We have two great speakers tonight who will be joining us to talk about Measure 92. Uh, the first is Dana Bieber. Dana is the spokesperson for No on Measure 92. The second is Kevin Richards. Kevin is a carrot seed and alfalfa farmer from Madras, and he's joining us to talk about how Measure 92 is harmful to farmers. Kevin's also a member of the Oregon Farm Bureau and the State Young Farmer and Ranchers Committee. For those of you who are just joining us tonight, my name is Chris, and I'll be your moderator for tonight's discussion about Measure 92. If at any time you have a question you'd like to ask us, all you have to do is press zero on your phone, and just like raising your hand in a classroom. Our first speaker tonight is Dana Bieber. Dana is the spokesperson for No on Measure 92. Dana? Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening for a discussion of Measure 92. I'd like to take just a moment or two, if I could, and give you just a little bit of background on the measure. You know, Measure 92 uh, is a poorly written measure that doesn't pro provide consumers with reliable and accurate information about whether their food contains GMO ingredients or not. In fact, two-thirds of the food and beverage that's sold in Oregon would actually be exempt from Measure 92. At the same time, there are thousands of food products that don't actually even contain any GMO ingredients, but because of the way Measure 92 was written, they would have to be labeled saying that they do contain GMO ingredients. It simply provides inaccurate and misleading information to consumers. And not only that, you know, consumers who are looking for foods without GMO ingredients can do so by looking for two different labels, either the organic or non-GMO label. Both of those are reliable and accurate, unlike Measure 92, and in fact, Measure 92 conflicts with those two national labeling standards. But for all of this misinformation and inaccurate information that's provided to us by the measure, it's also very costly to consumers and to taxpayers. You know, there have been numerous studies that have been done on states who have looked at single state labeling policies, and it's estimated that the cost of an average family is at least $400 or more per year for the increased price of groceries. At the same time, taxpayers will have to pay for this. Measure 92 will have to uh, allow two new state bureaucracies to, be, uh, to write hundreds of pages of regulations and enforce the measure. There's no limit on taxpayer money that's spent, and there's no funding source available for it. It's costly, and it provides inaccurate information. And I'll let Kevin talk to you a little bit more about the farmer perspective. Thanks, Dana. Again, this is Chris. I'm the moderator on tonight's telephone town hall discussion about Measure 92. If you have a question at any point, please press zero on your phone so you can ask that question. Again, we want to hear from you, so please press zero on your phone. Our next speaker, again, is Kevin Richards. Kevin is a carrot seed and alfalfa farmer from Madras and he's gonna talk a little about how Measure 92 is harmful to farmers. Kevin's also a member of the Oregon Farm Bureau and the State Young Farmer and Ranchers Committee. Kevin, go ahead. Thanks, Chris, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us. I'm really pleased to uh, speak with you all tonight uh, about Measure 92 and uh, its impact on uh, farmers and, and urge you to, to oppose to vote no on Measure 92. Um, th there's four main ways I think that this is really going to impact the way families like mine uh, farm and, and many other families around the state. Um, the first is it, this is a standard that um, layers on a whole new set of uh, production and stewardship requirements necessary uh, to meet the labeling requirements. So um, stewardship in terms of uh, having to segregate crops if you grow uh, GE next to non-GE, uh, having to either clean equipment and having that additional cost and labor or in some cases uh, purchasing uh, completely separate equipment in order to, to meet um, the, the standard uh, required for labeling. Uh, it could be uh, additional buffer uh, zones, buffer strips, um, which takes land out of production or diverts it into different production and, and changes uh, the whole uh, cropping scheme on your farm. Um, so, so it just really could add additional stewardship costs that, that fundamentally change uh, the way farmers go about their everyday. Uh, and then the second area is um, the risk of lawsuits. So basically, Measure 92 would uh, create a special new right for anybody to file a lawsuit and sue 
uh, a food producer or a store, um, or in some cases, small farmers, um, and, and uh, sue them based on uh, the content of the food that they're selling, uh, even if it, uh, un you know, even if it was uh, an unintended presence of a GE in their crop. Um, and, and then the, the last two ways I think it really has a negative impact on, on agriculture and farming in Oregon is uh, the thing you have to realize is regardless of your view on labeling uh, per se, this is a labeling standard that would only apply to Oregon. So this would add uh, an extreme standard just for farmers and food producers in Oregon, which is certainly going to have a negative impact on our ability to, to compete outside the state and to uh, grow, grow food, grow crops as uh, efficiently and, and uh, profitably as possible. And then the last way is uh, that I think it's going to really uh, harm the future of agriculture and, and family farming in Oregon is by limiting um, the ability to take advantage of future innovation in agriculture, so new technology um, that might not be introduced uh, yet, but but's in the pipeline. So drought-tolerant wheat uh, crops that are uh, designed to to use water more efficiently, um, disease and and pest resistance, uh, and those type of traits in crops, or even uh, health and nutritional benefits. Uh, Measure 92 um, effectively stigmatizes technology and discourages the introduction of of new uh, valuable. Uh, crop varieties that could offer a lot of uh, potential for Oregon uh, family farmers. Thanks, Kevin. For those of you who are just joining us, again, my name is Chris. I'm the moderator for tonight's telephone town hall about Measure 92. If at any time you have a question, just press zero on your phone, just like raising your hand in the classroom. And if you want to learn more, you can go to factsabout92.com. But before we take our first audience question, we actually want to ask you a question. So using your keypad on your phone, I want to know what actions you would be willing to take to help protect Oregon farmers. Push 1 on your phone if you'd be willing to encourage friends and families to vote no on Measure 2. Push 2 if you're willing to write a letter to the editor about voting no on Measure 92. Push 3 if you'd be willing to share information on Facebook or Twitter about why you're voting no on Measure 92. Or push 4 if you're willing to do all of the above. Again, push 1 to encourage friends and family to vote no on Measure 92. Push 2 to write a letter to the editor. Push 3 to share our literature on Facebook or Twitter. Push 4 to do all of the above. The first question actually comes from uh, Donald in Westland, who actually had to run, but he pressed zero, and he said that he wanted to know, how does this affect consumers in other states? people say in Wisconsin? Does this make a difference to them? How does it work? So, Dana? I'll go ahead and answer that. You know, um, this is an Oregon-only labeling requirement. So it requires that Oregon food producers and Oregon farmers have to comply with this. So they are the ones who have to comply with it and put the label on the product. But the only the way it affects other uh, state citizens in other states, any product that is sold in the state of Oregon would also have to have a label on it uh, saying that it contains no GMO ingredients as well. But, you know, the fact that it is only one state that is enacting this labeling law, no other state in the entire country would have a law that is identical to Measure 92, that's where the real costs and burdens come. You know, for, that's why Oregon farmers are opposing it and urging a no vote. It's why it's costly to consumers, and that's why they're, we're finding consumers across the state urging a no vote. Thanks so much, Dana. Again, my name is Chris, and I'm the moderator for tonight's event. If you have a question at any time, please go ahead and press zero on your phone now if you'd like to ask that question. Uh, you know, we actually had a question that someone sent in earlier for Kevin that I wanted to ask. Uh, and Kevin, you know, there's a lot of talk about how farmers are going to have to implement uh, things if this goes through. So can you tell us a little about the costs and burdens of meeting the segregation requirements in Measure 92? Sure. Um, Measure 92 basically uh, requires that farmers uh, verify with a signed affidavit the way that uh, the, the variety that they've used to produce their crop, um, and uh, in doing so, uh, forces them to follow a set of production practices um, that requires segregation of crops uh, that uh, no scientific or regulatory standard uh, would require. So, um, for example, if I was growing um, GMO uh, wheat next to non-GMO wheat, 
Uh, I couldn't necessarily harvest that without, with the same equipment. Um, I wouldn't necessarily be able to use the same planting equipment. Uh, if I did, it would be uh, a lot of additional time, labor uh, necessary to, to clean and ensure that uh, there's no um, unnecessary, uh, unintended presence of uh, one variety and another. So um, that on-farm segregation is, uh, is very significant. Um, and then in, in many cases, depending on the, the crop and the variety, uh, it may have to have some sort of spatial segregation as well. And so uh, land that I would used for a particular crop in the past, I might not be able to use because I need to maintain a buffer zone, a, a space uh, between one crop uh, and another. So that could potentially take that land out of production, could divert it into another crop that's less profitable and, and changes the whole um, landscape and, and crop rotation that I have designed on my farm. And then because uh, farmers are required to um, provide a, a record of the crops that they grow, uh, there's a, quite a burdensome uh, record keeping requirement that's necessary. Uh, and then having to uh, you know, have that uh, ensure that that's in compliance and, and any necessary testing to, to verify and, and so on and so forth. So uh, basically it's asking farmers to follow a whole set of production practices that, that aren't supported um, by any sort of uh, scientific or regulatory standard. And, and I think the biggest thing is that they are production practices that aren't compensable. So you're not getting paid in the marketplace for following these standards. Uh, it's just an additional regulatory burden. It's not uh, a market-driven uh, standard um, that you know typical value-added crop uh, would get compensated for. That makes sense, Kevin. Thanks so much. Uh, our first question tonight comes from Mark. Mark had a question about some of the basics on 92. Mark, uh, are you there? Yes, I am. Go ahead and ask your question, Mark. Well, it seems like there's a huge debate going on both 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 sides. And I just wanted to know a little bit more, being a being a voter, why I should vote against 92. What what the the full implementation of this is going to be, and how hard is it really going to be on the farmers? Because I'm from a coastal economy, so it's not as big a prevalent uh, issue for us on the coast, but it, it does affect us. Mark, this is Dana. I'll go ahead and take the first part of your question, and Kevin can answer the second part about farmers. But you talked about the basics of it. You know, to hear the proponents talk about Measure 92, they say it's all about the right to know. But, you know, that's actually where the measure fails. It, it fails on its fundamental promise to provide information to consumers. And I'll give you a few examples of what I mean by that. The first thing that the proponents did when writing Measure 92 is they actually exempted two-thirds of the food that's even sold in the state. So food that actually contains or was made with GMO ingredients gets a special exemption. An example of that would be um, all meat and dairy products that come from animals or fed GE grains or injected with GE medications get a special exemption and wouldn't be labeled. So you can see that already it's not about getting accurate and reliable information to consumers. So I think it fails in that way. And then the second area you mentioned about is, you know, what is it going to do for consumers and farmers? So I'll take the consumer part of it. It's going to increase the cost of groceries. And here's why. You know, it's not about the relabeling. I mean, yeah, there, there's definitely a cost with that, but that's a nominal cost. The real cost for consumers comes from the fact that food companies, just for the state of Oregon, would have to remake their food with higher-priced non-GMO ingredients in order to avoid having to put that misleading and inaccurate label on it. That's where the food costs, in, costs come in for consumers. And, and Kevin, I'm sure you can speak briefly to the impacts for farmers and, and what, what happens for farmers. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And I, I think a lot of voters look at the issue and, and think, well, there's not a lot of, uh, maybe there's not a lot of agriculture uh, directly in my community, or um, I might live in a, in a coastal county um, like the caller. And um, they're not really sure where the impact might lie. And it's true that, um, that uh, to date, GMOs um, are in a limited number of crops, but I think by far the biggest cost of um, Measure 92 is, is an opportunity cost. It's um, a measure that really uh, drives innovation and uh, drives uh, technology out of our state. And that means that for any farmer uh, in, in any area, particularly smaller and niche farmers that are, you know, might be on the coast or uh, in, in uh, um, you know, right outside a community in the Willamette Valley or something like that, um, they're, they're basically limiting the future opportunity to 
uh, to introduce and, and commercialize the, the highest quality uh, crops and, and the best technology uh, in agriculture so that farmers and, and family farmers can stay on the cutting edge, remain profitable, and, and do what we do best. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, again, if you have a uh, question you'd like to ask us, all you have to do is press zero on your phone. Uh, our next question comes from uh, Don and Hermiston. Don, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Kevin, I live in Hermiston, and this is probably one of the larger agricultural areas in the state of Oregon. Uh, you've mentioned that in order to harvest GMO crops or non-GMO crops, but everything has to be cleaned or different equipment. Uh, has anybody made an estimate of that cost, uh, even a rough estimate? I mean, how much is it going to cost us citizens that have to buy groceries if the Thanks farmer so has to that. do that? Thanks so much for that question. Kevin, do you want to go ahead and answer? Well, um I, I can't uh, speak to the exact cost of on the farm. I think it could be quite significant um, depending on the crops you grow and the size of your operation. Um, so, uh, for example, depending on, um, you know, if, you're, if you grow a lot of uh, wheat, it's possible that in order to meet the standard um, that it requires a whole uh, separate fleet of equipment. Uh, and if not, then, uh, you know, during the busiest time of year when you're in harvest, you might have to pull out of the field and uh, clean equipment or, or – um, um, you know, make sure that there's there's that uh, segregation and no unintended presence. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, depending on the crop. So, for example, we raise hybrid carrot seed, uh, which requires um, uh, distance from from other crops or, or from other from other carrot seed. And so, uh, it would likely significantly uh, increase both the uh, spatial distance, so um, increasing up to half a mile, a mile. Uh, between uh, different varieties of carrot seed, uh, or, or making a you know introducing temporal differences where we uh, can't plant at the same time and uh, need to completely adjust our crop rotation. So I think it could be really uh, dramatic in terms of it, its direct cost uh, in terms of expenses, but also the way it just fundamentally uh, changes how we uh, plan our crop rotations and. Uh, choose what to grow on our farm. But I know that Dana can speak actually uh, directly on uh, some of the estimates of cost to consumers as well. Yeah, Don, that's a good question about the cost because, as we all know, nothing is free and certainly Measure 92 isn't. So obviously we've got the cost there on the farm, but it goes all the way to the grocery store and what families are going to end up paying. And there have been numerous studies that have said single state labeling policies increase the cost of groceries by about $400 a year for the average family. Well, you think of all the families in Oregon, we're getting to millions and millions of dollars. And it's not just consumers who end up paying. Again, it's taxpayers. I mean, there's two government bureaucracies that are going to write all the regulations. They're going to have to inspect and monitor and test everything from all thousands of farms and thousands of food products and thousands of stores. Taxpayers, of course, are going to pay for all of that, and there's no funding source identified, nor is there any taxpayer limit. So thank you for that question, Don. Thank you both so much. Again, if you want to ask us a question, all you have to do is press zero on your phone. Uh, you can also learn more at factsabout92.com. And we actually want to ask you another poll question really quick because we want to hear from you again. Um, and we want to know what worries you most about Measure 92. So push one on your phone if it's the impact this could have on local farmers. Push two on your phone if it's increasing grocery costs. Press three on your phone if it's misleading labels. Press four on your phone if it's all of the above. Again, we want to know what worries you most about Measure 92. Press one for the impact on local farmers, two, increasing grocery costs, three, misreading labels, misleading labels, four, all of the above. Our next question comes from Catherine in McMinnville. Catherine, go ahead and uh, ask your question. Well, well how, how can people not understand that the weather – and 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 the other things that you have no control over. I mean, say you can say one one year, you know, well, we can do this and that, but when the weather comes along and destroys your crop and the, the other problems that you have, it doesn't make sense that people can even consider some of the things they're considering. Yeah, Kevin could no, probably I, speak I, to Catherine, that. This is Kevin. I think you're exactly right. I think uh, it's really a, a, an unfortunate and, and short-sighted measure. 
Um, people don't realize how dramatic the impact could be on agriculture and on family farming in our state. So I think you raise a great point. Yeah, you know, that's right. There's so many uh, there's so many things that farmers already have to deal with, too. But, you know, there's already so many things that taxpayers in the state of Oregon have got to be focused on. Education funding and public safety. There's a lot of demands on very limited resources. And yet, here we are with another unfunded uh, proposal that has to be footed by taxpayers. Again, press zero if you'd like to ask a question. Our next question comes from Doug in John Day. Doug has a question about the, the implementation of this, the bureaucracy, the cost. Doug, go ahead. Yes, uh, my question was very simple. It's, you alluded to it a minute ago, but here we are, the taxpayers of Oregon, trying to fund our school systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, Measure 92 says that we are going to be paying for another bureaucracy to oversee the farmers, the seed growers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you mentioned the cost of food on the table for someone like me. Uh, it's not going to be just food on the table for somebody like me. I'm going to be paying more taxes for that bureaucracy that's going to be created. I'm 70 years old, and I've never seen a bureaucracy die. They just get larger and larger and larger. And I don't know if anybody has uh, uh, has an estimate of what this bureaucracy is going to cost the people of Oregon, along with the food prices and so on and so forth that we're going to have to to uh, belly up to the board to to pay. Doug, you are exactly right. Uh, in fact, the only correction, though, that I would make to what you said is you said there is a new state bureaucracy that's going to have to uh, do this. Actually, no. The way Measure 92 is written, there are going to be not one but two state bureaucracies that are going to regulate and enforce this. There's no funding mechanism for it that's identified, so it's going to come out of the current uh, funding, and there's no taxpayer limit that can be spent. So you talked a little bit about the cost of how much this would be. Um, the uh, Department of Administrative Services has estimated that it would be at least $7 million a year to enforce this, which that makes sense if you think about these two state agencies are going to be responsible for um, testing and inspecting thousands of farms and hundreds of thousands of food products in tens of thousands of stores across the state. It's all going to be paid by taxpayers. And I also should point out, although these labels, uh, it would be a GMO label, let's remember that there are already two existing nationwide labels that already provide consumers with accurate and reliable information. It's the non-GMO label and the organic label. So we already have labeling in place. Measure 92 just creates an misleading and inaccurate information, and it increases costs. Thanks, Dana. Again, if you have a question, press zero on your phone. But what would really be helpful to us right now is if you want to become a part of this coalition against Measure 92, all you have to do is go to factsabout92.com. You can get all the information there, and you can sign up. We're going to take our next question from uh, Leah in Dallas. Leah, go ahead and ask your question. Yes, good evening. Um, I have a couple of questions, and my first question is to either one of you. Um, I joined in the conversation late. Who actually, what, what group, who, what business group, whoever entity started this movement to require Oregon farmers to have GMO labeling? Who was it? Do you folks know? You know, uh, Leah, this was brought to us, actually, this was a, uh, similar to a failed initiative uh, that Oregon voters rejected in 2002, and then a group also recycled it, took it to California a couple of years ago. California voters rejected it. They took it up to uh, Washington last year. Washington voters rejected it. So it's the second time that it's down here back in Oregon. So it's a group of folks who are just, who are committed to putting a label on food despite the fact that it is inaccurate and misleading. And that's where that came from. The reason why I asked that question is because my husband and I used to be um, natural beef farmers, and we sold directly retail. And we discovered, we learned, the American Grocers Association, so a federal entity, started a movement like this to heavily tax a retail entity like ours. Um, well, I bet, and, we, and we discovered it came from the American Grocers Association. So my point is, goes to my next question, which would go right into this, is who is it and 
could you tell me, um, are other states, for example, if a gentleman or a farmer is growing corn in California and they come to Oregon to sell their corn, are they required to have a label? Yes, actually, Leah. Anything that's sold in the state of Oregon would re require that it would have to have a label on it. But, you know, one point you kind of touched on there was the enforcement of it. Who's going to enforce this? So, you know, that's going to be two new state agencies that are going to have to enforce it. But one of the things is those who face the enforcement mechanisms most are the Oregon farmers and food producers because it's a lot harder to go out and inspect any sort of farm, uh, you know, in Kansas than it is here in Oregon. And so that's why it puts the Oregon farmers on the front lines of it. And one other point to mention about the enforcement mechanism, it's not just the two new state bureaucracies that will be doing this. There's also a private right of action that's allowed under Measure 92. It says that any citizen or any trial lawyer can bring a lawsuit from anybody from the farmer to the grocer and anybody in between over words on a label if they think there's any inaccuracy in it. So they're also facing uh, time in a courtroom as well as um, fines by the state agencies. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, and Dan, if I could just add briefly, um, I, I think the caller raises a really good point, um, particularly because she mentioned that um, they uh, do or, or used to raise uh, natural beef, and I think it's it's small, innovative uh, farmers and ranchers um, like that who um, who are, but well, on one hand, the most vulnerable to the additional costs and expenses of uh, compliance with Measure 92, but um, those folks who who retail uh, food products who are also most vulnerable to those um, those lawsuits that you mentioned. Thanks, Kevin. Again, if you want to ask a question, please press zero. Uh, next up is Helen from Junction City. Uh, Helen, it looks like you had a question about uh, the burden of payment. Are you there, Helen? Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Ask That's your question. Fine. It's not Helen, it's uh, Dennis. I, I have Sorry a question. About that, I think uh, the others answered it, but I would, I've read quite a bit about it. And there, have you uh, considered that growing this, from what I've read, could have a definite effect on the GMO on the human body? Because these people, these uh, researchers, and these chemical companies that have promoted this, do not know the long-range effect that altering the food like this could have on the human body. Well, actually, Dennis, it's good that you raised that because that's the issue we haven't yet discussed, when in fact, actually, these are the foods that have been on our uh, family dining room tables for the past 20 years. Um, literally billions of people have eaten trillions of foods that contain GE ingredients in them. In fact, you know, just to put a little science into this, you know, this is, these kinds of foods have been studied by over 1,700 different uh, studies, scientific studies that have been done on GE foods, and they all reach the same conclusion. Not only are the foods safe, but beyond that, they are identical to non-GE foods. So they are the most tested uh, food that is in our food supply today. Having said that, I, I recognize there are still going to be consumers who prefer to choose foods that don't contain GMO ingredients in them. And for those consumers, there's not one but two national labeling standards uh, to look for the organic or the non-GMO label. Both of those are reliable, and, you know, they don't contain all these special exemptions and these loopholes, which is contained in Measure 92. Again, if you have a question you want to ask, please press zero on your phone. Uh, our next question comes from Becky in Albany. Uh, Becky wants to know a little about how much of our food is actually uh, GE. Becky, go ahead. Hi, it's Jackie. And um, I'm, a, I'm a bit concerned about celiac brew. And the um, the wheat that is generically altered. Uh, why why have they? Why is it important to change the natural seeds? Uh, Thanks. Thanks, Jackie. I think uh, Kevin. That's probably you know this better than anybody. Yeah, I think. Um, uh, so I think the question is, is why is it necessary to, to grow GMO crops? And uh, the, the best answer I can give is that it allows us to grow more uh, crops, more food, and it allows us to grow it more efficiently. So on our farm, we raise uh, GMO alfalfa, and uh, that crop uh, requires uh, 
less times across the field with a tractor, which saves fuel, it saves time, uh, it reduces emissions. Uh, it also allows us to use uh, herbicides much more efficiently, um, and so it lowers uh, the total uh, impact on the environment in terms of uh, herbicide use. And then the end product is uh, a high, higher yielder, so we end up with more, but we also end up with a, a better crop that's more weed-free uh, and, and more marketable. Um, so that's why we grow it, and I think that same is true for, for many other crops, whether it's corn or soybeans. It's allowing growers, it's allowing uh, farmers uh, to do more, uh, grow more uh, on less and less land with fewer and fewer resources, be it uh, 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 less water uh, in drought situations or uh, fewer herbicides and pesticides and so on. You know, one other thing I would point out is there is no GE wheat right now, and so there, that isn't even an issue with that. Um, there are only a few GE crops. Uh, wheat is not one of them, but, you know, corn and soy are two examples of them. But, you know, it's, when you look at the agricultural groups who are urging a no vote on Measure 92, it's for farmers who grow GE crops and non-GE crops. I mean, it's the Oregon Farm Bureau. It is uh, several of the local farm bureaus from around the state who are urging a no vote on this measure because they know that this puts – uh, Oregon family farmers at a competitive disadvantage. Great. Thanks so much. Again, press zero if you want to ask a question. And for more information, you can go to factsabout92.com. Our next question comes uh, from uh, is going to come from Elin. Elin, go ahead and ask your question. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I'm actually a farmer in southern Oregon, and it, it, it's really interesting because uh, obviously, we need choices in dealing with the pest and the environment and the weather and everything else that we're, we have to deal with. And I just want to reemphasize and really ask the question of truly, from a labeling standpoint, I'm, I'm all for people having a right to choose if they don't want certain things. And, but, you know, you've said it a couple times, but maybe just for more emphasis, there already are avenues. People can buy organic, and it's non-GMO. And But I don't know about the non-GMO label thing. That's new to me. But I know the, the organic thing has been around for years and years, which is a national program. So if somebody wants a choice, they can make that choice. So why cause more costs on uh, individual consumers in Oregon and impact farmers when there's already a solution. So help me on the, the other non-GMO labeling thing. You're, you're exactly right, Elin. There are two different labels. You touched on the one, the organic, so that has no GMO ingredients. The other nationwide labeling system is the non-GMO verified label. Uh, so that also has zero tolerance, so there's no GMO in those ingredients, and there's not all these exemptions and loopholes in it. But, you know, you also mentioned something about choices. You know, Measure 92 gives consumers fewer choices, because as we talked about a little bit earlier, what food companies will have to do just for the state of Oregon is they would have to remake their food with higher-priced non-GE ingredients in order to avoid having to put on that misleading and inaccurate label. So once you do that, you increase the price of all food products. You know, that takes away choices for families. There are some families that choose to have foods without GMO ingredients in them. They already have options. But there are families who don't have those concerns and they simply just don't care, but they certainly do care about the cost of their groceries. Well, when you start increasing the cost of groceries to put this unnecessary label on it, you take choices away from those families. Thanks so much. Again, press zero on your phone if you want to ask a question. Our next question comes from Celeste in uh, Pilot Rock. Celeste had some questions about the exemptions that exist in this measure. Go ahead, Celeste. Yeah, um, if you could just speak to um, more about the exemptions, because I was a little confused when you said that GMO products would be um, exempt, but then talked about how it would raise um, costs to um, food producers because uh, they would have to redo um, their their recipes uh, with non-GMO products if they didn't want it to be labeled. So if you could just speak to that a little more, um, I would appreciate it. Thanks, Celeste. I appreciate the opportunity to do it. So let's talk about the exemptions. You know, the proponents started with a blank sheet of paper, and the very first thing they did is they exempted two-thirds of the food and beverage that's even sold in the state. 
So we have only a third of the food that's even going to be covered under this measure. And included in those exemptions are going to be things such as um, all meat and dairy products, even though they come from animals that were fed GE grains and injected with GE medications, they get a special exemption and they're not labeled. So that, that right there is an enormous exemption for consumers who are looking for accurate and reliable information. And then the other, they're indefensible exemptions. Quite honestly, they just don't make any sense. You know, a, a can of beer doesn't have to have a label on it, but a non-alcoholic beer does. The can of pop that I buy at a deli doesn't have to have a label on it, but the exact same can of pop that I buy at the grocery store does have to have a label on it. It just simply doesn't make any sense. And now, at the same time, there's thousands of products that don't actually contain any GMOs in them, and that's the products that, for example, contain sugar or cornstarch or soybean oil. There's no GMO ingredient in any of those processed products, yet they would have to be labeled saying that they do. That gives consumers misleading and inaccurate information. Thanks so much. Again, press zero if you'd like to ask a question, and you can go to factsabout92.com for more information. Again, we want to hear from you. I know we asked this poll question earlier, but I think some of you might uh, want to respond again. So I want to ask, what actions are you willing to take to help protect Oregon farmers? Push one on your phone if you'll encourage friends and family to vote no on Measure 92. Push two if you'll write a letter to the editor about voting no on Measure 92. Push three if you share information on Facebook or Twitter. Push four if you do all of the above. Again, push one to encourage friends and family to vote no. Push two to write a letter to the editor about voting no on Measure 92. Push three to share information on Facebook or Twitter. Or push four to do all of the above. Our next question comes from Dick. Uh, Dick, are you there? Yes, I am. Go ahead and ask your question, Dick. Yes, I am. I'm here. Okay, go ahead, Dick. What's your question? Yeah, uh, I don't have a question. I just have some simple uh, statements to make. Like, for example, I uh, raise a 50 by 50 garden, and I use natural fertilizer. I have raised chickens, and I put fertilizer out there, and I till it in, and have a beautiful garden every year. And my neighbors can't get enough of all my produce, and my grandparents uh, raised a uh, a wheat and way back in North Dakota and everything else, and everything was natural. And uh, I, I don't know why the government has to get involved and tell us what we can and can't do. Yeah, hey, you know, that's exactly right, Dick, and that's exactly what's happening under Measure 92. You know, the government's trying to come in and create the, the two new state bureaucracies that will have to enforce this, and it will really puts a further burden and regulation on farmers. And as Kevin can tell you, that's not – farmers need the opportunities to grow the crops that they choose that works best for their farm, and he can speak to that. Yeah, Dana already raised the point a little bit earlier, but, you know, we already have uh, GMOs as the, the most – most researched, uh, most regulated crop in history. And so uh, federally, USDA and FDA um, uh, are already regulate uh, these crops, and just having a, another fragmented uh, state-level uh, requirement for farmers is, I think, just a, a huge and unnecessary burden. And I think it's really important that, that all voters and all farmers uh, you know, speak out and vote no on Measure 92 this, this election. Thanks, Kevin. And again, if you want to join the coalition of folks that are voting no on 92, you can go to factsabout92.com. Our next question comes from uh, Sue in uh, Oregon City. Sue, go ahead and ask your question. Yes. First of all, thank you for this forum because uh, it just shows once again the American people are thinking and can make good decisions if they're given the information. I was astounded. I'm a caregiver to my 91-year-old mother, and I was at her residential care, which is a very nice place in uh, southeast Portland. And a whole bunch of elderly people were gathered together and were being pretty much sermonized. And then I stood there and listened and, and watched for a while. And they were actually having them make pledges to vote for this measure, and they were having them pretty well scared about it and obviously not giving them the full facts of it so i asked them i asked i raised my hand they said well are you ready to vote yes to and i said no but i have a question for you are you you a democrat and they she said reluctantly well yes i am but this is about all people well there was nobody on another side to discuss any opposing view 
So first of all, I think that it is, after listening to everyone speak today and your information, uh, I really do believe that this is another attempt for a government type of intrusion into our lives. You know, uh, Sue, you make a good point, because one thing you mentioned is that the, the, the yes side was making all these, uh, trying to get all these people enrolled at your, um, at your mother's adult living facility. Did they ever bother to mention that that was yet another exemption? Food that is sold in adult living facilities is exempt under Measure 92. So I bet they failed to provide that information. So, you know, it seems they talk a lot about the right to know, but it appears that there's only a right to know when they say there's a right to know, and the rest of the time there isn't. And that's one of the many, many reasons that Measure 92 deserves a no vote. Great. Uh, and the next question we have here comes from Mary. Mary, are you on the line? Yes. I'm Go, ahead ask, go ahead and ask your my question. Qu my question is, why does the general public not trust science? First of all, farmers used pesticides and herbicides, and the, the public raised hell, said, oh, we don't want you to do that. So science develops a product that uses less, needs less of those products, and now, then they say, oh, we don't want you to do that either. Why, why, do, uh, why does the public not trust science anymore? That's a good question, Mary. Kevin, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, Mary, I, I see the same trend. Um, and I don't have a good answer to your question, but I think the most important thing that, that uh, we as advocates for agriculture and, and family farmers can do is is try our best to educate the public. And uh, when issues like this come up, uh, as unfortunate as they are, uh, it's an opportunity to, to get out there and uh, let people know about the way uh, people farm in Oregon and uh, why it's such a, a vibrant and wonderful uh, industry. And in doing so, uh, you know, turn the corner and urge them to vote no on 92. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us this evening. This has been a terrific discussion. I think we've touched on a lot of issues, and we've really hit at the core of the failings of Measure 92. And, and what it really does is provide inaccurate and misleading information for consumers who may want to know things about the ingredients in their food. Measure 92 fails on that fundamental promise because of all the exemptions and the loopholes written into it. And, you know, also there are consumers, of course, who do want to choose foods without GMO ingredients in them. They can look for the organic or the non-GMO label. Both are nationwide labeling systems that are accurate and reliable. And they won't increase the cost of groceries for all Oregon families like Measure 92 will do. It will increase the cost by an average of $400 per family. At the same time, taxpayers have got to pay for this as well. Two new state bureaucracies that are created, they're going to have to enforce this measure. And it hurts our Oregon farmers. That's why this coalition has come together with the likes of Kevin Richards and, and the Oregon Farm Bureau and local farm bureaus urging a no vote on Measure 92. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't get to your questions. We had a lot of great questions. There's a voicemail at the end of this where you can leave your question, but we really encourage you to go to factsabout92.com and ask your question there. We want to hear from you. We will get back to you. So thanks so much for joining us, and have a great evening.